Doctors and nurses of Reddit, what was the creepiest last words you heard from a patient right before they died? I don't care that I'm not a nurse, but this was said by my dad to the nurse, so close enough. Backstory, dad had me. he'd had it since he was 18, diagnosed at 20, married my mom at 24, had me at 29, died 15 days short of 45, 6 months before that, he was put on hospice, he and mom were discussing funeral arrangements, and my mom jokingly said, you know Tim, the best thing you could do would be to die on a Wednesday, that way we can have the body prepared on Thursday, the viewing on Friday, and the memorial on Saturday, so more people could come. The morning we got the call that it was time, my mom, two sisters, and I were about 5 minutes too late. After we said our goodbyes, the nurse pulled my mom aside and asked if that day had any significance. It's not even 6am yet, so mom doesn't even know what day it is much less if it's important. The nurse tells her it's the 21st of May, number, nothing is coming to mind. The nurse told her that the previous day he kept asking what day it was and they'd tell him it was the 20th. He'd look irritated but accept it. That morning, he asked what day it was, and they said, it's Wednesday, the 21st of May. He smiled, squeezed his favorite nurse's hand, and was gone almost immediately. It was Memorial Day weekend, and we did just as he and mom had planned. And despite many friends being out of town for the holiday, we had over 250 people show up at the memorial service, overflowing the tiny church more than it had ever been filled. To his dying day, he was trying to make things easier for our family. I miss him. Hey, out of this whole thread, this one got me the most. People who think of others in their last moments are really the example we should all live up to. Thanks for sharing. Hugs for you. But I don't know how to get there. Grandpa in hospice. Hadn't spoken in days. Died about 2 hours later. Yup, that's creepy as all freak. I overheard an old lady whisper this to her old husband dying of kidney problems. You are going to beat this. You got away with murder. This is nothing. Got away with murder is often used as a metaphor for pulled off some dodgy risky crap. Or, you know, he killed Summerson off a beach. I work in a cardiac IQ. We had a patient who had a pulmonary artery rupture, a rare, but known complication of a Swangans catheter. One minute he was joking around with us and the next bright red blood was spewing out of his mouth. His last words before he died were why is this happening to me it still haunts me years later. I can't imagine how awful that was. Nurse here, had a patient come into the air with shortness of breath. He started deteriorating in the air and then quite rapidly on the transport up the IQ. We got him wheeled into his room, replaced the lines and tubes with our own, and transferred him from the transport stretcher to his IQ bed. He actually did most of the transfer himself. He didn't say anything, but just before he died he pleasantly adjusted his own pillow, laid his head down, and then his eyes went blank. This man just made himself comfortable before laying down to die. I'm a nurse and was previously working at an assisted living community on the dementia alzheimer's unit. My very favorite patient had been declining pretty steadily so I was checking on him very frequently. We would have long chats and joke around with each other, but in the last two weeks of his life, he stopped talking completely and didn't really acknowledge conversation directed at him at all. I finished my medication rounds for the evening and went to see him before I left. I told him I was leaving for the night and that I'd see him the following day, and he looked me in the eyes and smiled so genuinely and said, you look like an angel. I thought it was so sweet because he had not seemed lucid in weeks. He died the next morning. It really messed with me. Whoa, that put a tear in my eye, and I'm not the kind of guy to have that happen to me. You obviously had a very positive effect on the final weeks of that man's life. Hold your head up high. My grandfather on his deathbed said they have no eyes, still give me chills. The long troll. My dad fell into unconsciousness around noon. We managed to get him into bed and he responded with a hand squeeze when I said I love you. We watched and waited the rest of the day. Around 3am his breathing changed and as his breathing become more and more labored he bolted upright. Eyes wide open. Looked at his wife, my sister, then me. And smiled, exhaled, and died. My first hospice case. She was on morphine and started mock smoking. She looked at me, took my hand and said please in the most pleading voice I've ever heard. I sat with her body until the corner arrived. 
She has no friends or family. Only her lawyer showed up. I've only done one hospice case since. That's so sad. She must have been so lonely. Get home safe, little one. It wasn't what he said. He said the same thing to me anytime I had him as a patient for the evening. It was how he said it. He gave me this look and pause like he knew. The DNRs in my experience always know when it's time. It's creepy. Relieved. They're relieved when it comes. Most of my patients were older and usually happy that they might see their friends and family again. Relieved that the pain will be gone and that they won't be lonely ever again. Speaking of, if you have older relatives that on buttholes, please visit them. They miss you. Cardiac IQ had a gentleman who was DNR on comfort care. He was demented and was cursing like a sailor. He seemed to have moments of clarity and would ask to see his brothers, who were both passed. After a particularly worrisome heart rhythm, he went back into a sinus tachycardia and looked me in my eyes and said hey, what's your name? Kabk, what do you do here? I'm a nurse. After this, he was quiet for some time. Then he said, frick you. And then he died about 20 minutes later. I can only imagine what was going through his mind as he passed. Nailed it. Hug. I was a hospice nurse for many years. Super gratifying job for a nurse. Surprisingly, as a regular nurse, you were rarely offered thanks. Hospice nursing is an island into itself. Mostly peaceful. Lots of times sad. Often a blessing. This is sad, but also creepy. And I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't seen it. Had a 20 year old kid, gang member, who was dying of primary liver cancer. Super unusual, aggressive, and terminal. He was angry at the universe. His family was there to comfort him, but he literally spit in their faces. Every ounce of energy he had left was angry and mean and ugly. His mom would beg him to lighten up and accept Jesus into his heart. He would swing at her and tell her to F herself. The family remained beside, in hopes he would chill out at the end. His last day, hours, moments, he was angry. The family called me into the room and told me they thought he was going. He wasn't responding. Chain Stokes breaths, eyes glossy and skin cold. The end was imminent. His lovely mother, in her dearest attempt, whispered to him to go towards the light, to her geezus. With his dying breath he opened his eyes, looked at her and said F your geezus. A second or two later, he slowly turned his head to the to the left and got the most horrific look on his face as if he was looking at something we couldn't see, and horrified, like in a bad movie, his face contorted, and he screamed with his last breath, eyes wide, oh crap, oh crap, oh hi on you, then made a guttural noise and promptly fell back into the bed and died, every family member was shaking and too frightened to speak, and I left the room and took two days off, I don't care if I never find out what he saw, well he was angry at the idea of Jesus, right so maybe jesus showed up and took him to heaven and now he's up there sitting in a corner scowling my grandma died in 1989 my grandfather bob died around 1965 she never remarried never dated but she did have a great life when she was dying she yelled bob bob here i come oh honey i've missed you so much we always joked that we were glad she didn't yell bob who the heck is that my mom was watching over my great grandfather in the hospital. He'd been unresponsive for a day or so, when suddenly he said, It's about dang time you got here. I've been waiting and then he died. I found one of my comfort measures only patients standing at the side of his bed. It surprised me because he had been mostly unresponsive during my shift. I helped him back into bed and he asked me why all these people were in his room. He suddenly became quiet again and I noticed he wasn't breathing. He was a DNR so there wasn't anything to do to try to bring him back. Looking back he may have been talking about me and the CNA that was helping me get him back into bed. But who knows what or who he was seeing the last minutes of his life. Still creeps me out a little when I think about it. My father-in-law sat at his mother's bedside for days as she was dying. She was in and out of it and spent a lot of time in conversation with her parents and siblings who were all long dead. One of the last intelligible things she said was, leave the gate open, Rodney, I'm coming. I'm an apprentice funeral director. We went to a nursing home on a removal and as we were walking down the hall one of the patients got antsy and opened the door to his room and saw us walking with the stretcher. I'll see you next week boys. And guess who we had to pick up the next week. It never ceases to amaze and entertain me how gallows humor makes it into our lives. 
DNR patient was on comfort cares, was on a high dose of morphine and hallinating. She would alternate between grasping for things not there and trying to climb out of bed. She was too unsteady to walk so my job was to sit in the room and make sure she was safe. She tried to get up and I went to ask her what she needed. She grabbed my arm and pulled me down towards her face and said, very angrily, kill me. That one fricked with me for a while. I was in the hospital for a week on morphine. After a while that stuff really starts to mess with you. Checked in on a patient before the end of my shift and she was in good spirits. Had been joking with me the whole time. Her condition was tenuous, new trash, but she had been positive throughout. I asked how she was doing and she replied by singling the old grey mare ain't what she used to be and wished me a good night. I came in the next morning and she had coded and died overnight. Last year, my grandfather started desperately pleading for his life with his German captors from World War II. The doctor present was smart and said in German, you are free, Herr Katikature, you are free, and then he died. That was nice from the doctor. Came into an early shift and was handed over a patient who'd been very anxious and had a panic attack overnight. He was anxious all morning but obs all fine. ECG fine and so I just asked someone to sit with him to keep an eye on him reassure him for me. He gets worse. Really panicky. Heavy breathing. He's on his side in the photal position. But doctors will be in in 10 minutes so I tell him I'll get them to him as soon as they come in but ask if he'll lie on his back for me to help his breathing. He tells me he won't make it until they get here and that he won't face the other way. Ob's still all fine at this point but he's more agitated so again I suggest he move position for comfort and that's when he says I won't make it until the doctors get here. If I turn to face the other way I'll die. He repeated this a few times to me. He arrested literally as the doctors walked in and he died on the side he'd been refusing to turn to. I'm convinced he knew. Comma if I turn to face the other way I'll die. That was my exact same thought the first time I had a panic attack. Back when I was a CNA this one resident fell off a bike for exercise in PT and seized. They came to and became lucid and said I think I'm dying but everyone in the room assured her that wasn't going to happen. She seized up and was dead within minutes. Paramedic. 17 YO female. Car crash. Please. 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 Don't tell my parents I was drinking. See you there. That seems more reassuring than scary in my opinion. You're not gonna believe this. Talk about a cliffhanger. Can't wait for season 2 of Old Man with Heart Failure. Dang you. I laughed pretty hard at this. Not a hospital story, but according to my family my great grandfather was unresponsive his final few days, but suddenly sat bolt upright in the bed and then had a huge smile and raised his hands out as if greeting someone. Then he fell back and died. It was the same with my brother, but he didn't sit up. He just smiled, lifted his hands up and out, and died. I've commented this somewhere before but it stayed with me. I'm an RN and while I was a student I was caring for a lady who had end stage renal failure, had a DNAR and was shutting down. We were having a little chat, while well, I was chatting away while helping her put on some lotion, when she stopped, looked over my shoulder and said Bill's here love, I've got to go and swiftly stop breathing, read her old notes and Bill was her deceased husband. I worked a bank shift in A&E a few months ago, a young man was in a horrible car crash. His face was covered in blood and had a compound fracture of his clavicle but conscious. He was screaming don't tell me she's dead. Where is she before succumbing to his injuries an hour later? His girlfriend had died instantly in the crash. I'm a hospital chaplain. When I was a CPE intern, a greenhorn, I went to see a patient in the IQ who had 10 to 12 oranges on her table. We talked about oranges for about 20 minutes and then she said, something's going to happen. I went to check on her the next day and the nurse mentioned that she passed the previous night. I asked if anyone else talked with her and she said no. So, the last conversation she had was about oranges with me. I kind of wish we talked about something else. However, the nurse said that was a worthy conversation that the patient wanted to talk about. It made me feel better. Because oranges are foreshadowing someone is gonna die. I was in the army in Pakistan to for humanitarian support after an earthquake. There was a very serious school bus crash when a road gave was and a dozen kids were killed. The first kid that we took off the ambulance and put on the stretcher to carry into Wattridge tent said, more like screamed, 
something in Uru. When we got there the doc asked the translators what he said. It was the spiders are eating Papa. We all just looked at each other for a second, then just proceeded with Tridge. My grandfather was on hospice care at home and for two days he told us that he had to go with the little red haired girl. We didn't know what he was talking about. When he died, we cleaned him up and called the hospice nurse on duty, who came right over. I happened to be the one to answer the door and there she stood. 5 foot 2 or so, with gorgeous blue eyes and the most beautiful red hair you've ever seen. I couldn't even manage a low, but my grandmother looked around me and said very cheerfully please come in, he's been waiting for you. Sounds like the opening of some kind of feel good ghost story. I actually have three that stick out in my mind. An 83 year old woman that said my mom's here. Are we going she died a few minutes later. Another older lady said I think I'm going to die today. We took vitals. Everything seemed fine. She was stable. She had a heart attack a couple hours later. Not her last words, but the last she ever said to me. The last one is definitely the creepiest. A nice old lady who told my CNA she wanted to wear all white. When asked why, she said the man in black is here. She looked in the corner of the room. The CNA looked, but there was no one there. That's when I came into the room. We asked her to describe what she was seeing and she said he's in all black, and he's got a top hat on. Then she whispered and his eyes are red while her eyes moved across the room to directly behind the CNA, like she was watching him move closer to us. She died later that night, but it was unexpected. That room creeped me out for a long time after that. Sounds like she was talking about the hat man. That is creepy as freak. My grandfather's brother, he died exactly 6 hours after my grandfather and just minutes before he died he said I'm going to see you again brother. He didn't know at the time that my granddad, his brother, had died. The family were going to tell him the next morning because he was having a bad day. I'm working on my mother's eulogy for tomorrow's wake. I'm going to go into detail for anyone that is smoking because I think it's something you should reconsider. My mom was diagnosed with terminal lung and pancreatic cancer. Mass had developed around her vocal cords and made it hard for her to speak. She smoked all of her life, and it finally caught up with her. It attacked her quick. From time she was diagnosed, to time she passed away, it was less than two weeks. First she lost her voice, then she had difficulty breathing, became weak. She couldn't walk too far, then she could only walk a little, then nothing at all. She had trouble eating. The night she died I let her smoke her cigarette. Doctor said it didn't matter anymore. And my sister and I took mom into her bed and I knew as did my sister. It was the last time we spent a few hours with her, holding her and I got up, lost it a bit. And my mom said don't be sad loudly with all her might. I was fortunate to be with my mother at that time. She was due to have hospice that Monday but she did not make it. Lung cancer kills quickly. I hope none of you have to deal with that. Consider it that next cigarette. It's just a matter of time. Well enough preaching. Intubated PT wrote on a clipboard. If this hurts, I'll get you. Just before the surgeon pulled out the PT's chest tube. Post open heart surgery. The tube ripped one of the coronary grafts. He bled out in about 5 seconds. Serious, what is the most shocking thing someone confessed while on their deathbed? I'm a medical student and I had a female patient who was new to our practice who was HIV positive. I needed to ask her how she got the virus that is sexual or IV drugs. She tells me it was sexually transmitted, and the only reason she got tested was because her partner of 3 years last words to her as he was dying in hospice was I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I wanted to tell you, forgive me, heavy stuff. That is heavy and tbh, pathetically weak on his behalf, like, tell the frickin woman so she can get treatment sooner rather than later, if he loved her at all, he should have manned up. I have a good and a bad story for this thread. I'll start with the good, it's not exactly on the deathbed, but as close as she was able to at the time, my aunt had cancer, she knew she was going to die and she knew it would probably be in less than a week, she couldn't eat and drinking was hard, she wanted to be sedated heavily, kept asleep permanently, essentially, for the last few days because this whole dying thing sucks and I've had more than enough, so fair enough, a doctor is called up. A plan is made and carried out. The last thing my aunt said before going under for the rest of her life was ah, I see the stars. They're sweet and run carefree. Gather them up. And that's when she went under. 
she died three days later. Nobody knows what she meant, but somehow, those last words fit her, so my uncle, her husband, got them tattooed on his chest, over his heart, the bad, my other uncle had been in a car accident, it was bad, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, he said tell my wife that Wendy is my daughter and I love her, name changed for privacy, he died a few minutes later because of internal bleeding, Wendy was the neighbor's then 5 year old child, that caused a huge shit storm, I can tell you. My dad was adopted from a woman who went to my grandparents church and got pregnant out of wedlock. My grandpa confessed on his deathbed that he had actually had an affair with that woman and he was my dad's real father, which was why he suggested adopting him in the first place. Bro, that's intense. I can't imagine the mixture of emotions that your dad and grandmother must have felt. I was told by my father that in addition to two other kids he had that I knew of, there were more children of his out there, also that only two of his kids were with the same woman. Four of them showed up at his service, in addition to the other two, making it seven of us present. We also found out that he may have had other kids elsewhere but my family kept really poor records of things, so I have never found out who they are. Most of that was word of mouth from old friends of his. Weird note, but all of us got together and now stay in contact. We had a good amount in common and see each other when we can. Your relationship with them is better than mine with the siblings I grew up with. I had an old uncle who refused to die until his lifelong mistress came to see him. When he was he was in a new country and met an amazing woman, but when he went home to visit an arranged marriage was set for him, and his father was ill so he ended up staying and having kids. He later immigrated back with his new family and found his old love had never moved on. He never stopped loving her either. They got back together. Both women knew of each other but never met his kids called her auntie and knew of her but never met her. On his deathbed he kept on fighting to live. His son asked him do you want to see auntie? He eyes grew as he tried to communicate yes. The son called auntie to let her know he was dying. She said she knew and was waiting in her car out in the parking lot. Auntie came to see him and within 5 minutes he passed away in her arms. Holy crap. I don't believe in soulmates but that's the only way to describe this. My mother died when I was 11 of stage 4 cancer while she was on hospice at home. My grandmother, on my dad's side, was standing by the bed. She woke up, heavily medicated, pointed and said what are you doing here? I never liked you. Not especially shocking but hilarious. It sounds heartless. But my grandmother gave my mom heck when she was alive. My other grandmother, mom's mom, tried to hold in laughter as she told her she taught her better than that. As my mother lay in her hospice bed dying of cancer she beckoned me closer to her and said I've hidden the money. I've hidden the money in the... She was having trouble speaking and getting breath and her voice was cracking. She tried one last time the money's in the... She closed her eyes. Her breath stopped and her head slumped to one side. A few seconds later she burst out laughing. She was pranking me. She died 3 days later. Your mom sounded like a cool lady. Sorry for your loss. Not necessarily a confession, but I used to work in an assisted living home and on his deathbed a resident apologized profusely for molesting his daughter's son just minutes before he took his last breath. Dang that freaking sucks. My grandpa told my dad he loved him for the first time when he was dying from cancer. Grandpa was a drunk all throughout my dad's childhood and had a strained relationship with the family. So this was pretty surprising to hear from him. My mom told me about the death of her father, my grandfather, and his last words to her. She said he was on his deathbed and it was obvious he was nearing the end. He motioned her over to tell her something. She went over, leaned in close. Expecting some declaration of his love for her or some deeply insightful. He said the good family silverware is hidden in the ventilation system about 15 feet out from the furnace. She looked at him like he was crazy. He said what? We travel a lot and that's where I hid it. That crap's expensive he died the next morning. My mom's aunt, when she was dying, revealed she'd had the hots for my dad for years. He claimed to be mad he never married her after divorcing my mom since she had some money to her name. I met a lady on a train to Edinburgh who was really nervous because she was on the way to meet her brother for the first time in 70 years. Her parents had told her that he died when he was one, but they'd given him away because they couldn't afford so many kids. 
She didn't find out he was still alive until her mother confessed it on her deathbed. I can't imagine how someone can keep a secret like that for so long. Me and all of my cousins were gathered around my grandfather's hospice bed as he laid dying. Each and every one of my cousins, there's a lot of us, gave him a kiss and tried to talk to him said they loved him, etc. But he wouldn't respond to any of them, just stared. Until I came up, I sat on the edge of his bed, holding his hand. Everyone was watching us. He looked at me and said, I don't like Mexican food, and that was it. And the family was never the same. I have a great aunt that passed away when I was 17. Just before she did my older brother confessed to her that I was gay. She called me in and explained how our family has been through so much and that she was willing to totally accept me for who I am. I think that is great of her to be that open minded. Only one problem I'm not gay. She never believed me because my brother had confessed it. I had a hospice patient who asked everybody, is it the 13th of December since mid-November she had been asking this. We'd hear this question multiple times every day and just assumed it was a family member's birthday or something. The 13th of December finally rolls around, and that's the day she dies. That's chilling. My mum was from China though we are now happily residing in an European country. We went back to China for my grandmother's last few weeks as she was dying from terminal cancer. On my grandma's last days, she requested that mum stay with her alone. And it was only then she revealed that my mum wasn't her biological kid. My grandma confessed that she has bought my mum from a child trafficking ring. Which was common in China, because she had tried for many years and still couldn't get pregnant. My mother cried a lot. Not only for the unimaginable pain that her biological parents likely went through in losing a baby, but also for the fact that my grandparents have went beyond to treat my mum as their little princess. They literally did treat my mum as their own. They were never abusive and only gave her the very best in life. They even willingly send my mum to the US for university education even though they aren't rich by any means. Whoa, I can't even being to imagine how hard that would have been for your mom to process. My heart goes out to her. I wish that there was a way for her biological parents to know that she is okay. Well, it was intended to be a deathbed confession, but she pulled through. My GF's mom told my GF her birth father's name after saying she didn't know. She was whoring around and couldn't remember. It was Orange County in the 80s and apparently my future mother-in-law fricked and did drugs with most of the lowlifes in Southern California. But she did know who my GF's dad was and finally told her after 30 plus years. Turns out he now lived less than 3 blocks away in our small town in the Mojave Desert. His kids look exactly like my GF did at their age. We didn't make contact, as his criminal record is a mile long and he's a crappy person by all evidence good gravy. Her story sounds so much like my brother's. My mother worked as a nurse in the biggest hospital in Copenhagen. A dude is terminally ill with cancer, has his wife, children and entire family next to him. He decides before he dies that he was gonna phone the girl he was cheating with on his wife to meet up at the hospital when the entire family was there. My mother had to move the entire family into another room when she showed up because of massive shouting and hysteria. What a selfish prick he was. Jesus. Like, sure the dude was dying and all, but still colon. Would have been sweet. Sweet karma if his entire family just walked out then and left him alone with his side chick. If you're going to choose her over family. My grandfather was in the hospital in a pretty nasty state. He barely could speak, but he made it clear to us he had something to say. He had my mother get him a piece of paper and a pen. Thinking he has some important words to leave us with in case he doesn't have the chance later. My mom does just that. There's silence in the room as he scribbles something onto the paper. With my mother and her two siblings waiting in anticipation. My grandfather finishes. And with a big smile turns the paper for us to see. I've got a girlfriend. It read, as he pointed to Anna. A neighbor and friend of his. The goofball ended up pulling through and living several more years. Depending on whether or not he was still married to your grandmother, that's adorable. My grandfather was dying of cancer. He was 90. Our entire family would sit with him in his own home, tending to to him, in shifts, making sure everyone had alone time with him and to all feel needed and loved during his passing. Gramps would regularly point to a spot where no one was and say, 
hello, Hazel, they are all here again and then smile. Or he'd say, yes, dear, that's Linda's little girl. Hazel was his wife, my grandmother, who had passed away two decades prior. The chilling bit was that grandpa would then turn to us and say, oh, I forget you can't see her. Shortly after he was diagnosed as suffering from the final stages of heart failure, a few weeks before he died, my grandfather told me several stories about World War II that changed my view of him and of war in general. Now, before I start, I should tell you that my grandfather was one of the kindest men you'd ever meet. Always friendly, never drank, the kind of guy who gave the shirt off his back to those who needed it and handed out the biggest candy bars in town on Halloween. Everyone loved him. Shortly after D-Day, my grandfather was part of a 12-man rifle squad fighting in northern France. As his unit entered a seemingly abandoned village, they were ambushed by a squad of Germans and the unit was torn apart. They won, but by the end of the fight only three of the Americans were still alive, and one of them was badly wounded. The squad leader and his assistant were dead. The two unwounded soldiers swept the battle scene and hauled three badly wounded German Wehrmacht soldiers into the middle of the street. My grandfather looked at the other American soldier, said no prisoners, and cut the throat of one of the Germans right there. He said he almost puked because there was way more blood than he was expecting. His partner lifted his rifle to shoot the other two, but my grandfather stopped them. He said that there may have been other German soldiers nearby and didn't want the gunfire attracting them. So they dragged the other two into the shallow ditch on the side of the road, with about 6 inches of water in it, and stood on the German soldiers heads until they drowned. After that, he said he hated Germans. He confessed to a number of war crimes, including shooting German civilians and killing German soldiers who were trying to surrender, apparently a not uncommon occurrence. But the worst, he told me that he only felt guilty about one thing he'd done. In early 1945 his new squad was going through a small German village when he and a couple of other guys kicked in the door to a small house. Inside was a small old German woman in a wheelchair, who immediately started screaming and cursing at them in perfect English. My grandfather kicked her wheelchair over, rolled it out the door, and then knocked an oil lamp over as he left the house with his partners. She burned to death. He looked at me with cold eyes and said, that was too cruel. She was an old woman. I should have just shot her. Dang. My father apologized to my mother for the way his side of the family had treated her, especially in the first few months after the wedding, and the months leading up to his death. This same family screamed and shouted, as the hearse was leaving the house to go to the cemetery, about how much they didn't get from the will. After 30 years, I have, for the first time, attempted to reach out to one of them that actually apologized some 5-10 years ago. My husband's aunt, Mexican family, confessed to him on her deathbed that she spiced her tacos with Kroger brand taco seasoning. He's still a little shocked about it sometimes. This made me laugh. I can picture my granny doing something like this. My dad had an impacted bowel and was heavily medicated. Before he went in for exploratory surgery, he tried to write a letter to me expressing his feelings. He could barely talk before he went into surgery. He kissed me and had tears in his eyes knowing it was the end. The paper was folded and said on the front only open if I die. While he was in surgery, I selfishly opened it. It was a few paragraphs of unreadable scribbles that I couldn't read. He made it through the surgery, but also got diff since the hospital sucked at washing him so he was put into hospice, which is basically where you're put to die. I know this isn't quite that bad, but if he died, I'd never know what that note said, and it would weigh on me for my entire life. He later told me it probably said how much I loved you and wish I did more for you or some crap. You know, dad's stuff. He's the best. My grandma confessed to my mom when she thought she was dying. She got better. That she tried to coat hang or abort her. Obviously it was unsuccessful. My grandma was a religious woman and decided that God wanted her to have this baby and treated my mom like her favorite child. This messed my mom up for a while and it was even more awkward when my grandma surprisingly got better. After grandma died for real, my mom eventually made peace with it. After she was born, grandma never treated her like she was unwanted. So mom understood she was in a vulnerable place at the time. Mom was the seventh child in a poor family. Yay the time before birth control. 
Not exactly his deathbed, but he was on the verge of death and couldn't speak after this. My father confessed to me that I had a sister that he never told me about. He had fathered a child with a woman right before he and my mother got married. And his parents paid the woman off to go away. That was 18 years ago. We are now good friends. The sister and I. And she is a welcome part of my extended family. When my great grandfather died, me, my cousin and my dad visited him in the hospital right before he passed. When we were leaving both my father and cousin gave him a hug and said their goodbyes. I did the same, but when I was about to move away he grabbed my hand and held me there for a few more seconds. I was always close to my great grandparents, closer than any of my siblings or cousins, but he never showed how much he loved me until that moment. No words, just holding on one last time. His death is the hardest hurt to deal with, much because of that moment. My grandfather passed away early October 2016. He never said much throughout his life. A stern navy man that served in the VO-76 in Vietnam. He was though a diehard SF Giants fan though. In his last moments my aunt whispered it's okay to go. The Giants beat LA. He smiled and passed away that night. My grandpa when he was dying. He awoke after being asleep for most of the day and it was around 2am and me and my cousin were on watch to wake up my mother, who's a nurse, if anything was going wrong. He sat straight up and looked right through me as if I wasn't there and started talking to his sister who had passed decades before. He loved her so much and always talked about how much he missed her. He was having a conversation hey Lena, I've missed you it hurts followed by unintelligible mumbling and groaning. It wasn't so much what he said but how he said it as if she was standing in my place or right behind me. He didn't even acknowledge me and it really kind of freaked me out. The next one which is actually a cherished memory was when my grandmother from the other side of my family was in hospice and on her way out. Her and I always used to joke about death and how it was shocking she was the last of my grandparents as she smoked. Drank and stayed up all hours of the night watching TV. She was my best friend for my whole life and really I wish I would have known it was the last time we would talk. She was in her hospital bed and looked at me as I held her hand and she says I'm ready now you want the jello now grandma. I asked her. She genuinely got forward and said no I'm ready. I'm ready to go chase rainbows and she relaxed and said she was tired and wanted a nap. My son who was 2 at the time said I love you as we left and she was the second person he ever said that to. Frick, I'm crying just thinking about it. She was such an awesome woman. Miss you grandma. My grandpa's brother died of Parkinson's a couple of years ago. He was on hospice and all his loved ones were there to comfort him before he passed. He was incoherent his last couple of days but just before he died, he sat up, looked at an empty corner and said mom, you came for me, laid back down and died with a smile on his face. My great grandma was definitely someone who would come help her child transition to the next world, if there is one. She was a great lady. That's such a beautiful and touching story. Natural order of the world is that your parents go first. And even though you manage to learn to live with this new reality, without them, you still feel like an orphan child. The comfort he must have felt to see his beloved mother after all this time was probably incredible. This was surprising to me but more sad than anything. I was always close to my granny but I never had the heart to tell her I'm gay as I had only heard her say negative things before about homosexuality. I didn't want to upset her and cause family problems. Towards the end she had suffered strokes and was unable to talk. My mother and uncle were in the hospital with her while she was dying. During this time my uncle confessed to my mother that granny had always known I am gay and that she didn't care and love me. I regret not having the balls to tell her before she died. While my grandma was on her last mile she wanted everyone to come up to her and she tell them something she always loved about them. Nothing was shocking except when it was my turn. I go up to her, give her a long hug and she tells me I was her favorite grandchild. I turn around and all my cousins were giving me the meanest looks. I said nothing and went back to my seat. Later on, one of my aunts comes up to me and said the reason why grandma said you were her favorite grandkid was you let her be herself. This is such a sweet sentiment to go out on. Your grandma sounds very thoughtful and special. 
related to me by my mother before her passing. My great uncle admitted that he had killed his first wife by beating her to death with a bowling ball because he found her molesting their neighbor's son when he was 5 years old. This was when he lived in Ireland and a few years later he moved to America met another woman and lived his life happily had a number of kids and grandkids. It put most of the family into shock as my great uncle was one of the most non-violent people you would ever meet. But no explanation on how he got away with it. Or any more than that. He died like 3 minutes later. Shook my family up for a while. That first sentence was a roller coaster. Somewhat related. As my grandmother's mother sighed. Where with all began to go. She did things she never would. Had she been at full mental health. Now she never liked my father at all and always gave him a tough time when she was around. Well the last time she came over she gave my father $50 bill for no reason when he opened the door. This was 3 years ago and that $50 bill is still in my dad's wallet. He said by no means will he ever use it because it was the only kind thing she ever did for him in the 30 years he knew her. My great grandmother asked my mother to go clean her toys out of her nightstand before the rest of the family went through the house after she died. My mom thought it was hilarious and awesome. I died a little. We were asked to throw out my father-in-law's Playboy and Hustler magazines before his daughter saw them. My grandpa was dying 3 years ago. He died at the age of 104. The last day I saw him he was sitting in his chair. I had come by to chat a bit with him. We were talking about the military since I'm the military and he had been for 65 years. All his life he had been telling us how he had been fighting the German invasion of Denmark. Well this day he told me quietly and full of shame that he was helping the Germans taking Denmark. He regrets it every day he said. Comma I'm the military. Well if you're the military then I'm the senate. Back when I was in homeland, my grandmother told me how my grandfather would beat her. None of her children, my mother, knows about this. My grandmother was super religious my whole life. Always going to church and doing right by her community. In her last house she said she really did not believe in God and wish she had not wasted all that time in her life doing what she thought others wanted her to do. It was pretty crazy for her husband my dad and aunt to hear her say that. That story really turns Pascal's wager on its head. What disturbing fact came to light about a family member after they passed away? That my uncle passed from AIDS and not cancer like he said. Turned out he had been sick for a really long time. Gutted he never felt like he could share with us and went through it alone. That's heartbreaking. My great grandfather had another family that wasn't revealed until after he passed in his late 90s. He lived till I was in my mid 20s and not once would I have ever suspected it. He was present at every family party, took me for haircuts once a month. I cut their lawn every week. It turned out my great grandmother knew but hid it from everyone in the family. She actually knew his other kids and families. She told my dad while in hospice. The real kicker was when doing a family tree on one of those sites. It kept suggesting a public family tree I did not recognize. Turns out it was his other family. After my baby brother died, as big bro, I seized every piece of technology he had. Mom wanted his phone so I sanitized the frick out of it. After I broke into his laptop and started cleaning it up and organizing it I found several documents on there and found that he posted to several sites talking about how lonely and depressed he was. He talked about how mom's new husband had made his life heck and how it was fricked up that she repeatedly let him come back into her life after causing a lot of family drama. He also talked about how close he and I were and how he hoped to make me proud one day. I was always proud of him. He talked a lot about my daughter, his niece and how I was being the daddy she deserved and how proud he was of me. He wished that he and I had a dad like me when we were growing up. Instead he had me and I did what I could. I was only 8 years older and a child raising a child. He missed dad a lot because he had started to finally change after years of abuse, but then up and died. He also talked of all the times he thought about suicide. How he came close to doing it but never did follow through. I miss my brother so much. My grandfather always kept the door of his home office locked. When he died in 1987, my grandmother just left the door closed and locked and eventually misplaced the key altogether. When my grandmother moved into assisted living last year, my mom and I cleaned out her house. I live closest so it was on me to wait for the locksmith to come and open the office door. 
The room was like a time capsule, complete with Winston cigarettes still on the desk, with butts in the ashtray and bills and a newspaper from 1987 stacked neatly, and the office was filled with photographs. My grandfather was a photographer so this was no surprise, mostly they were from his job, and some were of the family, the house, vacations, etc. But then I found a locked file cabinet drawer and got curious suspicious, fully expecting to find naked pictures of my grandma, but not wanting to be the one who accidentally sold a cabinet full of cash or something. I popped the lock on the drawer with a letter opener, it was full of pictures of naked ladies who were not my grandmother. Probably a dozen different women. Some of them were obviously taken inside my grandparents house. Most looked to be from the 50s and 60s. Just judging from the hairstyles and shoes. These were not professional boudoir shots. Either. It was straight up nasty pee. I threw all the pictures away and never told anyone in my family about it. In 2009 I got a Facebook message from a guy saying essentially. Hi. I think we have the same dad. My dad died in 2004. I knew he had been married way before he met my mom but none of us knew he had a son that he abandoned. When the baby was 6 months old he up and left to join the army, never seeing his son again. So I have a half brother who is about 20 years older than me. Since I was the first to find out, I was tasked with telling my mother. I called her up and she basically said, Mel, your dad was bound to have some more skeletons in the closet that we didn't yet know about. The whole thing makes me incredibly sad when I think about it. Sad for this guy that didn't have a dad. He had been looking for him on and off since he was 17. But also sad for my dad that he carried this secret with him for so long. And died without ever having told anyone. It must have haunted him. I can feel yeah. I didn't meet my own bad until I was in my late 20s. I had have a stepmother and three step siblings. That my godfather was abusive to his wife and had tried to strangle her once. We didn't find this out until years after he died. Until his daughter finally snapped after hearing for the hundredth time what a great guy he was. The poor daughter. She had no allies. No one to turn to because she was so lucky to have such a great dad. Well this is not so much disturbing as it is awesome. My grandfather kept a big safe in the basement of his house and about 6 months after his death we bought a diamond blade saw to get it open as we had no idea where the key was. In short there was £250,000 in there that our whole family didn't know existed nor where it came from. I mean, I guess it's possible that he saved his wages over a long period of time to eventually have that amount. Possible. But extremely unlikely as he was a builder and not particularly wealthy. We all got a cut. Hello there distant cousin. That my dad had been recording and listening to all our phone calls. For years. We found boxes of cassette tapes he had hidden in his shop after he died. After my grandmother died. I learned that the bar she owned when she was younger was more like a whorehouse. Also. She was almost sent to prison for another reason. I learned so much this year that I now call this part of my family the bloody news family. Not quite the prompt, but I only found out a couple of years ago that my grandmother's sister hadn't just passed away at a young age. She had, in all probability. There are no official records but it is the most logical explanation for her disappearance at that particular time being kidnapped by the Argentinian military junta and either tortured to death in prison, shot by firing squad into a mass grave, drugged and dropped from an airplane. The possibilities are horrifying. I now much more clearly understand why my grandmother's family back in Argentina are so messed up. Not necessarily disturbing. But my grandfather knew he had cancer 6 months before he passed away. Even when his health declined rapidly the last 2 weeks. He never said anything about it. I kind of knew that was going on. He's too stubborn to let his family take care of him or be bedridden. My granddad did this too. My nana had died not long before. He was sad and lonely without her and refused treatment. Probably would have survived with chemo but I support the choice he made. Probably not the most disturbing but only after my maternal grandfather died did most of my family find out that he and my grandmother had been married over 50 years. According to my mom, they never celebrated an anniversary or talked about it much. Turns out it was a shotgun wedding necessitated by the fact that my 18 year old grandmother was pregnant by my then college student grandfather. This was a big and conservative catholic family too. 
I'm glad that now it isn't considered as taboo. My grandpa, father's father, was a pedophile. Apparently, it was one of those kept in the family secrets that were known by the immediate family but not told to the grandkids. There is the implication that grandpa may have actually molested a kid or had images of such, but I do not know. I remember being kept away from him as a child and none of us were ever left alone with him. He always unnerved me when I was small, which I think was probably due to the adults all tensing up when there was a child in the room. I was told by my mother a few hours after his funeral. My great grandmother tried to get custody of me, claiming my mom had abandoned me. When my mom divorced my biological father, to get away from him, he was very manipulative and abusive, she packed up everything and moved up to Georgia. For nearly a year, I stayed with my great grandparents while my mom went out to find a place to live, find a job, and also she met a man who would become my adoptive father, and give me his last name. My great grandmother was a bit manipulative and controlling herself, she was also delusional. She believed that my mom had abandoned me, and set about trying to get custody of me. She tried to rope my grandmother into it, but she wouldn't have any of it. She worked for an attorney, and she said, prove it, great grandma couldn't. My mom told me she'd visit weekly, and once she got settled in, she came and got me. Must have been tough for both you and your mom. After my great grandfather passed we found an abnormal amount of pee. This man was 85 and the pee dated back 60-50 years lots of vintage pee. My great grandma saved 13 million over her lifetime. It all went to my grandpa. My grandma died. He remarried a nut job. He got lymphoma and died 5 years after the diagnosis. The day he died, his wife took their picture off the wall when they declared him dead. After the funeral she got in his truck and we never saw her again. Not necessarily disturbing, but surprising. My dad did one of those genealogy DNA things and found out that my grandfather was not actually his father. It appears that both my grandparents had multiple affairs and my father was the product of one. They stayed married to each other for more than 50 years though. I suspect this is more common than most people might think. That my great grandfather was an avowed racist, who had helped start a branch of the KKK in our area. As it turned out, most of his kids grandparents of my generation knew about it, but it came as a huge shock to us great grandkids. I grew up next door to him, and was constantly over there. He was a great guy, always had time to play with us kids, let us drive his tractors and four wheelers around his yard, gave out $50 cash on birthdays, and made it to every family event, where he talked to everybody. He never left any of us kids out. I grew up thinking he was a hero he'd fought in World War II and a great guy. Then, at 11 years old, after his funeral, I find out he was horribly racist if he saw a black person in a store. He'd walk out, and find somewhere different to shop. He'd tried getting town ordinances passed so that blacks couldn't live in our little town. Eventually, when all of his other efforts hadn't stopped anything, in the early 80s, he'd started a local KKK group. It rocked my world. Couldn't believe that one of the nicest, sweetest guys I'd ever known was that sort of person. I still struggle with that sometimes. We never know what evil wrong hides within even our most loved people. It's actually a good example of that. He was your grandfather, you were a child. Of course you would think the world of him. Long after he died, we discovered my father and mother had to get married because of my older sister. They just lied about the year they got married. It's crappy only because my sister also caught outside the bonds of holy matrimony. And my mother treated her like absolute crap over it. That's so fricked up. My maternal grandmother was apparently married four times, and there's no father's name on my mum's birth certificate. She seemed to have had an interesting life. Shortly after my great uncle died, who had no wife or children, my mother found some of his military records dating back from World War II. It turns out he was captured by Japanese and sent to a POW camp and worked on the Burma Thai Railway. I'm sorry to hear that. On a night shift one night a very old patient started crying when talking about his time working on that railway. He had in his words a good life after the war, but the horror of that time and man's capacity for cruelty was a deep scar that time could not diminish. It broke my heart seeing him like that. There are no words or kind deeds that can heal that experience. 
not so much disturbing as much as wow, his untruths went that far, turned out that he did have a passport, therefore didn't enter and exit the country numerous times without documents, the police were not looking for him, he'd never created a new identity for himself by claiming to the authorities that he was born to a gypsy family and didn't owe thousands in tax, to say he was a bit of a fantasist is an understatement, but we knew it, he was, however, a cool uncle, especially once we could start going to the pub with him and I still miss him sometimes but we knew better than to believe everything he said. My grandfather's brother on his deathbed told his entire family that during the second world war he has an affair and a second family. This included an illegitimate daughter. Right before he passed he told them not to worry as she had been paid out of the will and any inheritance. I know this kind of situation wasn't exactly uncommon during the day and age. But it's still very sad to know that a person you may or may not have respected greatly had another family that he never wanted anything to do with. It sucks to have the realization, and it especially sucks for that other family. My dad, brother and grandmother died in a car accident. Turns out that was my dad's idea of suicide and he took them with him because he thought he was doing us a favor as my 3 year old brother had some form of retardation and my grandma was a horrible person. My grandfather-in-law, who has the same name as my father-in-law, had another secret family. He saw them every weekend when he was golfing. Apparently he kept in touch with them for most of their lives until he had a stroke and couldn't. A year after he died, one of his daughters contacted my father-in-law thinking he was the same man. That's when we found out. Never told his mother the truth though, although we don't know how she wouldn't know. Sort of jumping the gun but found out where my granddad dies. His daughter, my aunt, gets zero pounds from him. She has screwed her life up and is in huge debt and homeless, staying with us. And my son of a mother is sorting it all out for her cause she is doing nothing to help herself. My granddad's already helped her out a lot and it came to light when trying to sort debt relief that he's made sure I don't get a single penny from him when he dies. Sad as it is, it does make sense. If she's doing nothing to help herself, she'll most likely just waste the money instead of use it to get out of her situation. Apparently my great grandfather may have been a pedophile. My mom told me this last year and she and her cousins had to be careful around him when they were growing up. He never did anything to my mom but her parents as well as her aunts and uncles suspected that somewhere down the line. He was being inappropriate with someone's child but I don't think mom ever knew who it was and she is no longer alive for me to ask. My grandpa suppressed my uncle's passion for music. Not only did he suppress the passion, but my uncle is a very gifted guy regarding music. He has an absolute pitch. The occurrence of this skill is 1 in 10.000. I'm not really surprised that my uncle is in a miserable state today. About 20 years ago I had a boyfriend who got cancer and died within a year. As he got sicker I began to realize that all the stuff he had told me about his family was made up, and all of the truth came out afterwards. He didn't have a twin brother who trained dolphins at SeaWorld. He had a regular upbringing in the USA and not Morocco. His parents were normal boring people from Michigan, not an actress and a professor from Paris. Even his exotic sounding first name was invented. He was actually named Steve. Interestingly there was one thing that was true. His cousin who worked at NASA really did. I guess that was already interesting enough that he didn't have to make that up. As to why he did this, it was never clear. He didn't lie about other stuff as far as I know. His real family was on the other side of the country and didn't want to visit while he was sick and didn't come to the funeral either. The whole thing was sad and strange. And that's why he invented a new family, cause his real ones were crap. My paternal grandmother, we called her nanny, gave birth to baby girls in unwed mother's homes three times before she married my grandfather. We thought that it had only happened once. That one got adopted out to a couple in Australia. We are all from New Zealand. And I went to visit her when I was a kid and went to her wedding. But once nanny died my aunt tracked down a second one, who lived about two hours away from us. When I met her it was like seeing a ghost. 
She looked just like Nanny, and acted just like her as well, even though they had never met. I remember she walked ahead to open the gate for the car and turned around to lean against it, and my mum gasped and whispered that's Barbara to my dad. But the saddest thing is that we have since found out that there was a third, another girl, but we can't find her. My aunt found a nurse that remembered Nanny and swears up and down that she was there to have a third child. Unfortunately the building burned down not long after the birth and the records were lost, so we will never find her. I've also since learned that my dad is not my grandfather's child. Nanny was pregnant when she met him. This is an open secret in the family. We don't talk about it, especially not to dad, but we all know. Apparently Nanny had quite a sad life before she married and there is a story about a man that was the great love of her life but she couldn't be with for some reason. I don't know that story fully though. I only heard it mentioned once when my mum was drunk and feeling chatty. This is why birth control is so important. Birth control wasn't available when Nanny was a young woman, especially in the rural areas where she lived. Had she had access to it, her life might have turned out very differently. Nanny hated women the whole time I knew her. She didn't like her female grandchildren and had no female friends. She was openly sexist against women, despite being one. I wonder if girl children reminded her of her babies that she had to give up and that was why she didn't like us. This is so sad. My mom's cousin Greg died before I was born. They always said he died in a house fire and couldn't get out in time. I didn't find out until I was 18 and came across my mom's old diary that I found out that Greg had actually set the fire himself. It was a suicide. That my mom had given birth to twin boys while in college, long before meeting my dad. The father was a professor in her department. She went away for 9 moss without telling her family, saying she was taking a class for her major. She was not keeping in touch, however, and her family grew increasingly suspicious. Eventually, her sister came up unannounced. She knocked, and my mom answered, obviously pregnant. The sister went back and let the family know what she had seen. My mom had the babies, put them up for adoption, and returned home to an icy, silent reception. The reason for her absence was never spoken of. I didn't find out until many years after her death. That my grandfather lied about everything. My mom was getting a family tree together. She kept hitting blanks when adding him to the tree. They weren't close due to him being in butthole. So she asked her brother for help making sure she had all the info right. Eventually came to light that he didn't technically exist until he enlisted in the army at 17. He lied about his date of birth and his name. My great grandmother is listed as having one child in a census we found, but no name and everything relating to him is false. He lived his entire life with a false name and false birthday. I want to know what happened in his teenage years that prompted that choice. My great grandmother was most likely a lesbian and a kleptomaniac. The most shocking to me was my grandfather who was all about the marines. Everything was about the marine corps. I always thought that he was a long term marine and had fought in world war 2. Turns out he was in for less than a year and did maintenance on docked ships. My. Gay. Partner that was kicked out for being gay served a lot longer. My family makes fun of the fact that he. My partner. Was ever in the marines. But still act like my grandfather single handedly won the war. He was buried with full military honors. Shortly after his death it was explained that my uncle molested his younger sister for at least a year, not sure how long it went on exactly, but it happened and everyone came to know about it and just seemed to try to forget it happened. My dad told me about a day after he passed away for whatever reason because he didn't want us kids, my sister and I, to have our views on him impacted any more than they were. He was a belligerent drunk and alcoholic who most of the family except ours, ignored. She went on to sleep with all but one of her sons as well. What the frick? My dad passed away a year ago from a heart attack. Upon trying to set all his paperwork straight, I found out he had been spending around $600 1000 a month in slot machines at the hotel in the next town over. He was taking out money at the hotel ATM. Full stop. Not sure how much of that he got back, if any. It had been going on for at least 2 years according to my uncle. I never knew he had a gambling problem, didn't see him often enough to notice, comma he also was retired and didn't cash out that much from his retirement. 
found divorce papers for grandmother and found out that my grandfather was divorcing her because she abused him. She was given custody of my mom instead of him. I wonder how different she would have been if he had custody. She is a very easily manipulated and timid person. I wonder if grandma was abusive to her as well. It's almost a guarantee. Abusers will do so to anyone they can. And a child is a perfect victim. I don't know that this is disturbing per se, but my dad died in 2015. And last month we found out that he had had a son when he was around 20. So now I have a half brother. I found a freemason coin and a lot of other symbolisms in my grandfather's stamp basket. Not sure what the implications are. My great aunt passed a few years ago from cancer in her mid 80s. When she was young, she'd had an affair with my great uncle and years after his wife's passing, when they were in their 50s, they got married. It was one of those sordid family stories that they'd all made peace with ages ago. So after her death the family all got together to clean out her semi hoarder level house. In their digging they found a birth certificate for a baby she'd given birth to in the 50s when they were having the affair. She had hidden her pregnancy and given up the baby, but she had kept a copy of the birth record and a baby bracelet for the rest of her life. She definitely made the crappy choice to have an affair, but it still breaks my heart that she kept that loss to herself for the rest of her life. People who have heard deathbed confessions, what were some interesting ones? My grandma confessed to murder on her deathbed. Usually you'd think it was the pain relief, but she was such an eccentric it was actually believable. We traced all her ex-husbands, partners and any other likely candidates and fortunately no one was missing or died an untimely death. But sometimes I wonder. She was just that good. My dad had Alzheimer's and ended up in a secure ward. He was blind and almost deaf. I was visiting him one day. He didn't know who I was, but he started talking about me. He said I had done better than him in life and that he was proud of me. He was a quiet man Iral and never told me that when I was growing up. Looking back, he did things that my dumb butt never realized were for me. Like, when he retired his colleagues asked what he'd like as a present. He chose a scientific calculator this was back in the 1970s. He had no use for it. He gave it to me for university. I thought he was just passing it on. Not realizing that he'd asked for it with me in mind. AWW My grandpa, a Sicilian man with blessed cooking skills, told us on his deathbed that his meatballs were actually frozen meatballs from the grocery store. As the grandchild of Sicilian immigrants, the only bigger scandal I can imagine is if he had admitted his sauce was store-bought. My grandma suffered from dementia for many years before she passed. It got so bad she didn't remember who her family were, and would barricade herself in her home because she was scared of everyone. She even forgot she smoked and would find her cigarettes months later after forgetting where they were and claim she was desperate for one. She'd put them away after one and that would be her again for months. The only memories she had left at the end was that her sister used to be able to play the piano beautifully and her husband, her childhood sweetheart, was gone but she didn't know where. He died some time earlier. She spent her days waiting for him to come home from wherever he was. My John will be home soon she would say. Or someone would walk past the window and she'd double take and say thought that was my John. It was heartbreaking watching her deteriorate until she was on her deathbed, unaware of anything or anyone. I went to say my goodbyes to her in the hospital and she held my hand and told me how much she loved me but how she was ready to go be with John now. In that moment, she remembered who I was. What was happening to her and that her husband, my granddad, had gone already. She went in her sleep not long after that, and I'm forever thankful I managed to say goodbye and tell her how much I loved her too. I've held on to that moment for so long without really digesting it in any way that writing this just tore my heart out. I miss them both so much but I know they're finally together again somewhere. I don't know if this counts as a confession but it felt like one. My grandparents have three daughters. Everyone always said that my mom was my grandfather's secret favorite. He never agreed. I heard he was on his deathbed on the 6th of April. Went to see him on the 8th of April. He was scary looking and the doctor kept saying he didn't understand why he wasn't dead yet. The 9th of April everyone but my mom had the chance to come and say goodbye. She doesn't drive and my dad works 10 hours away. My grandpa kept saying her name. Well, saying, 
He couldn't eat or drink so it was more like a whisper. My mom came by on the 10th. He looked at her, smiled, whispered my Amy. He closed his eyes and never opened them again. I have an amazing one. My great grandmother lived a very long and interesting life. She was in her 20s in the Great Depression. She had a wild streak from those days that we don't know much about, to the point that we actually don't know our great grandfather's name, just the husband she took later. Over the course of her nearly 100 year life, she had collected owls, literally thousands of owl figurines. She had clocks, wall hangings, pot holders, lamps, stained glass art, salt shakers, and more little figurines than you could imagine, all depicting owls. We all wondered the importance of the owls. She never talked about them. We just all knew she loved owls. Well, when she was nearing death, at the age of 98 or 99, and the doc said she had days, my grandparents went and talked to her and they asked her if she had anything she wanted to share or ask before she goes. She thought for a moment, then said, I never understood the owls. It turns out, she didn't really give a crap about owls. Near as we could piece together sometime in the 40s or 50s perhaps, she bought either a trivet or a set of salt pepper shakers that were owls. Then someone got her the other. Those were the oldest owls anyone could remember. But from there, someone got her an owl to match. Probably a potholder or placemat. And all of a sudden her kitchen was owl themed. From there, it snowballed. The owls flowed like wine, baffling her for 60 years eventually taking over as the bulk of her personal belongings. The moral is, if you're not actually into something, mention it early. This is how my dad has come to have a huge collection of pigs. We didn't know he wasn't actually into pigs until I was well into my 20s. It's so funny, and weird, and now we buy him pigs as sort of a joke because it's become his thing even though it's not his thing. Not my story but that of a hospice worker who spoke to my class. For those who don't know, Hospice is a method of end of life care that focuses on alleviating the emotional and physical pain of a dying person to ease their passing rather than combating their imminent death. One of her patients was a bed bound woman in her 90s who was generally unresponsive but had flashes of recognition and engagement. It's hard to gauge the level to which unresponsive patients are detached from their surroundings, so they encourage family members to keep their company in hopes of soothing the patient. Now this patient was from a US state that prided itself on its state university and the university's football team. The woman's family had attended this university for four or five generations. During her hospice care, however, her great granddaughter was the first in their family to decide to go to a different school, the rival state's university. In fact, her family was supportive of her decision but often joked about her being the rebel or Judas or what have you. One day, they were all sitting around the woman's bedside teasing the girl about her decision. Suddenly, the patient sat up, looked at her great granddaughter, said, traitor, and freaking died. That is glorious. Side note, I really hope this was Osu and Michigan, because I so could believe that. This isn't a confession, but I just wanted to share the last thing my grandfather said to me before he passed away due to lung cancer. I was about to go to Rome for a school trip and my family told me to go to set my mind on something else for a few days. Before I left I wanted to say goodbye as it was possibly the last time I could talk to him. He told me, have fun boy, I'll see you next week. I went to Rome and when I came back, he was already in a deep sleep due to medication. He wanted to peacefully pass away while sleeping. I came back the next week and he was sleeping when I went to visit him. I told him everything I did in Rome even though I knew he wouldn't wake up. The next morning he passed away. My grandmother said to me, he waited for you. I still miss him so much. Not only did he wait for you, he probably also heard every word you said about your trip. My partner's grandfather never spoke about his World War II service. We are Australian. He joined after lying about his name and age so we can't find any records. He would have been 16. We do know he was in the Pacific somewhere and when he got back his lie was exposed and because he was by then 18 he was drafted under his real name. And promptly arrested, he would do anything to not get sent back to fight. He got drunk, fought and self-harmed. His adult life was spent mostly as an alcoholic and being a crap husband and father though in his later years he was able to make some good. Grandkids appearing softened him. In his dying hours he relived his time at war. 
Some things he said. Oh god they are here. The Japs are behind us sir. Stab him. Stab him. Freaking stick him. Help. Medic. All around. And he also had a string of names he kept saying. Such a tortured. Broken mind. My grandfather who had not been a religious man throughout his life stated on the second to last day he was alive that in the prior few nights he was seeing beings in the bedroom with him. He could not discern what they were but one in particular made him very fearful. Art was intense a horror. A couple of days before my grandmother passed away she was really confused and was talking about my mother having a child a year or so after my own birth that was sent for adoption. She was talking about how sad and horrible this was and that I deserved to know. After my grandmother passed I confronted my mom about it and she neglected this, and I truly believed her. Couple of months later it turns out my grandmother was the one adopting away a baby girl who was born between my mother and aunt. My dad has a special ability to gain people's trust, in a good way. Twice now he's had instances where dying people tell him things that they feel they can't tell their family. The one case was when my aunt's mother-in-law was dying. She explained to my dad that her husband cannot live alone and that they both agree he must find a new partner after she passes. He did. He remarried within a year of her passing. At the age of 81, the family was very upset about him moving on so fast. My dad had to stand up for him and reassure them that it is what his late wife wanted. My time to shine. I worked at a hospital in Garmisch Partenkirchen, a small town near Munich for the last 14 years. My job there is not fancy at all. I move people around, throw the trash out and occasionally I take care of some handy like work, fix a leaking shower head and stuff like that. As you can imagine, I get to see a lot of patients that come and go. Some of them pass away, such as life, I guess. I remember a few instances of people confessing to me their biggest regrets. Here are some examples. An old Polish woman told me that she regretted not freaking Hitler when she had the chance. Her words. I wanted to ask her about more context, but I was afraid to be honest. Another notable example was an old truck driver that used to work for an Easter Germany company. He told me that he once run over some kids with his truck and was too afraid to stop and check if they were okay. Once another Polish lady told me that she used to be a prostitute during Second World War and that she slept with very high up people in the government. She told me that she did not regret that part of her life, but that she could not tell anyone and that was a heavy emotional drag. She also told me that she aborted more than 5 babies during that time. The two Polish ladies are the same woman from parallel universes where they made different choices. When I was in hospital, the guy in the bed next to me just asked to stop taking his meds as he was ready to die. Last thing I heard him say was there's no one waiting for me at home, so I'm going where they are. Wasn't really a shocking confession, just a lonely and heartbreaking one. My grandfather had pretty terrible dementia and he kept making deathbed confessions as he knew he didn't have much time left. They were often about witnessing a murder and not telling anyone, but each time he confessed to us the details changed. It happened a couple of times a day over the course of his final week. We finally figured out that he would watch the local news and hear about these things happening than would think he had actually witnessed them. We had a similar situation in our extended family. Alzheimer's made this family member insanely paranoid. He thought that people were constantly trying to break into his home and murder him. Turns out his wife was watching lots of crime shows around him and he could no longer distinguish reality from fiction. I didn't see it, but my aunt watched her elderly mother fall down the stairs and confess just before she died that she wasn't her biological mother. She told my aunt that her oldest sister was actually her mother. The sister had gotten pregnant too young and the mom said it was hers. A common way of handling it back then. She revealed it in her very last breath. Happened more than you think. Daughter gets pregnant. Tells only parents. Mom and daughter go on a long trip. When they return mom had a baby. Raised as another child of the mom. Try Graham Greene's travels with my aunt. My great uncle actually confessed to having two illegitimate sons right before he kicked the bucket in front of his own children and grandchildren. The crazy thing was that none of his children knew this life of his. Not even my great aunt knew about it because she would have made a huge fuss if she was alive at that time and knew about it. What was crazier was that these two sons already passed away 5 and 7 years ahead of him respectively. 
He was 98 years old and his invisible sons were 65 and 69 years old. The children found out they one of his invisible sons actually was a teacher at a school that his granddaughters attended when they were in high school. Nevertheless, his children decided to reach out to the children of his invisible sons. They got connected and learned more stuff about my granduncle. The craziest thing was that I actually dated one of the granddaughters of one of the invisible sons. The one passed away at the age of 69 years old. Talking about a few degrees of separation I... Not a deathbed confession exactly. I was a hospice volunteer and worked with a man with a brain tumor. He was in pretty shape except for that. He was going nuts in the nursing home and one day I took him for a ride around town. He had grown up there. Seemed like every other block he would point at an old building and say used to be a W house there. Empty lot. Used to be a building there and it had a pretty good W house there. There was a W there until it burned down. We passed by this old odd looking apartment building that had more doors than it should have and it appeared some of them were sealed up. He said, that used to be a crib and each door had a small room behind it and each W had her own room. We passed under a railroad bridge and he pointed a flat area and there used to be black woman that ran the best W house in the state right there. I finally laughed and said guess I know what you spent your youth doing. <laughs> Helped care for my dad as he died from cancer earlier this year. He would get agitated and reach his arms out and try to sit up. The last thing he said was fuck. Not sure what it was referencing. Pain. Drugs. Or war memories. But that stuck with me. He passed very peacefully in the end. I'm sorry for your loss but that would be my last words. Not a deathbed confession. But the last conversation I had with my grandfather has always stuck with me. He had Parkinson's. And lived on a farm outside of town. One day he looked at me and said I'm getting too old to take care of mom. My grandmother. I need you to do that for me. Okay his health deteriorated pretty rapidly from that point onward. I still call my grandmother every single day. And try to get back home whenever I can to help out around the farm. My great grandfather was in his mid 90s when he died. Health was always good. But a benign tumor deemed too dangerous to operate on at his age went septic. He was dead a week later. I went to visit him in the hospital. My family used to see him a lot, but there was a falling out between him and my grandma several years before, so we stopped seeing them. Funny enough though, I constantly ran into him at the store and we always had nice chats. Anyway, in the hospital he told me not to worry about him. Most everyone he's ever known was dead, and he was ready to die. The week he felt himself getting sick. He knows something was off and made arrangements to get my great grandma into a nursing home. He took care of her with her Alzheimer's. So he wouldn't die until he knew she was taken care of. They were married for over 70 years. My favorite story is that every Sunday for over 50 years. He would drop my great grandma off at church. And then sat in the car and waited for her. Hated religion. But loved his wife lol. Sounds like my grandfather in law. Although his wife passed first, he always took her to church even though he was an atheist, he loved her so much. After she died he put a mattress in a van and traveled the country visiting all 7 of his kids and then went home. It was his farewell tour and he passed soon afterward. Not exactly on his deathbed. My stepfather emailed me the night he passed away. In general, he was always in pain from chemo, cancer, meds and whatnot. He did not want to continue spending money as he wasted away. He asked me to never tell the rest of the family, but I'm taking all my sleeping pills tonight after your mom goes to bed. With luck, she'll never know the truth. It would break her. So sorry you had to go through that. I didn't witness this personally as it was between my grandfather and his father. My great grandfather was not a nice man. He beat his children. One time he beat his daughter with a table leg. And I am assuming did the same to his wife. Anyway, she left him and the kids behind this was the 30s and I am assuming that he didn't allow her to take the kids with her and it's not like women's rights were great back then. My grandfather left home at 8 years old and fended for himself for his entire life. On his deathbed nasty grandpa told the boys that he had a bunch of money stashed on the old property and if they went to see him, he would tell them where it was. No one went. I was a medic in the military and I worked in one hospital in Louisiana. I was assisting with a mature dependent wife at the end of a long battle with both dementia and cancer. 
Her last words were, damned, my pie must be burning. Mayo funny like a burnt toast smell moment. Funny because it isn't a sign of stroke. <laughs> Nothing dark, but unexpected for me. I spent a lot of time with my 90 something year old grandfather in his final months. He was married to my grandmother for over 70 years and told me he never slept with any other woman. This was followed by him asking me what it was like to sleep with more than one person in your lifetime. He, partially paralyzed from a stroke, at the end of his life, also told me, as he was waking up from a nap, that he was just dreaming about having sex with Betty Grable. I never shared these details with my family. Mother ran a nursing home growing up. From ages 5-10 I spent every weekend with residents. Because I was a kid, residents often confessed stuff they thought I wouldn't understand. Two stick out, one funny, one not. Women was dying, maybe about 96. Even had her last burst of energy life where she thought she was better. This is common. A black delivery man came with some flowers. After he left she looked at me with tears in her eyes and said, I can't believe I'm dying without having been with a colored man. Second one was while I was reading bible verses to a resident. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to drop that baby in the well. So yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and pretend I didn't see the part about the baby and enjoy this post. Thank you. This wasn't a deathbed confession, but more of hospice. This man was an alcoholic. This isn't usually a problem because when in hospice you can get whatever you want as long as it is legal, but he was a violent drunk and was forbidden alcohol as a result. Anyways between his requests for alcohol, he talked about how he and a friend got into a massive fight about land and his equipment being borrowed. As a result they haven't spoken in 20 years. He said he didn't even know why it was such a big deal and regretted being that aggressive. Basically said he missed his best friend and wished they didn't lose all those years. My great uncle had pancreatic cancer and was very frail because of it. I helped him bathe, use the restroom, and change him each morning. Not his last words to me but something he said that has stuck with me since where I hate feeling so useless. I can't do this anymore. I'm so sorry you have to do this. I told him I never minded doing this for him. I loved him so much. And I'd always be there for him. I had to move away a few weeks later because my mom wanted me back home as I was living with my grandparents and him at the time. He passed away shortly after, and his cat he had for almost 30 years a few days after him. He was a good man. Old pets always seem to go a few days or weeks after their owners do. I wasn't there to witness her confession, but the story leading up to it is intriguing. My mom was adopted, and my grandparents never kept it a secret. They loved my mom like their own. When she was growing up, she tried to find out as much as she could about her and her adopted brother's birth parents. Back in those days though, info like that wasn't exactly the easiest to find. My mom and uncle were brought to the orphanage with little to info on each of their biological parents, or was elsewise requested to be kept secret. Eventually, my mom found enough info from notes she had gathered, like which families might have been most likely to be related to her. Some property info one can find at the library, and she just sort of pieced this puzzle together over her life. At a certain point, she was able to get the names of her mother and her brother's mother. She was able to find out she was part of a big family, with lots of brothers and sisters. But, for my uncle, he found out that his mother had died not long after placing him for adoption. By the time she had gathered all of this info and found this much out, my mom was married, had my older sister and was pregnant with me. I can't remember exactly what it was she found that led to it, or if she heard something from someone, but she got a phone number. That phone number went to the house of her biological mother. She called, and the voice of a young boy answered. My mom asked for the name she knew and she hears. Yeah one second. Hey mom, phone's for you. My mom and her mom talk. It wasn't an easy conversation. And I'm just gonna refer to my mom's mom as Biogran from here. Biogran is not comfortable with my mom contacting her, at all. She doesn't ask my mom a lot of questions, but my mom says that she was just gonna talk and if Biogran wanted to hang up at any point, she could. My mom just gave her a short version of the story of her life, 
and then the conversation was over. Biogran after that, would send letters to my mom on occasion, but Biogran made a point of telling my mom she could never be found out by the rest of her family, and Biogran carried that secret with her until the day of her death. One of her daughters asked her, will you tell us where you went, when you went away that time? And Biogran finally confessed, she had gone to her home for unwed mothers all those years ago to have my mom, the child of her affair. I've met two of my bio aunts, and sadly both of them passed a few years ago. But dang. TLDR. My biological grandmother had an affair with a milkman, left to go to her home for unwed mothers, had a child, did not tell her family until her deathbed. Not exactly a deathbed confession but a day before. My grandmother passed away in 2013 and my dad in 2014. We never told our great grandmother that my dad was no more, because of her mental state at the time. She mentioned she could have done more for her eldest child. My grandmother was 12 when she was married off to my grandfather, and that for the past few days my dad is in the living room telling her it is time to go to our new home and that he is being very adamant today. She would pack her things tomorrow morning and would leave with him. She passed away the next day. Not a confession but still something that sticks out to me. My great grandma was in the hospital going in and out of consciousness. While falling out of consciousness one time she whispered mama and then she said it's beautiful. It still gives me goosebumps thinking about it. No matter if you believe in heaven after life or not I think it's really comforting. I like this. I bet it is beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Not really a confession but my cousin and I got into a car accident and he died. His friends got him to steal and vandalize so many things. They also put him in jail four different times. When we were in the hospital and he was about to die his last words were Welp if I go to heck at least I'll be with all my friends. I love you. Medical workers of Reddit. What were the most haunting last words you've heard from a patient? Not my patient but a friend of mine. He had a patent with a triple A. Abdominal aortic aneurysm your aorta is bulging and throbbing about ready to pop. The pain is very severe and agonizing and if it does rupture the pain immediately goes away and feels so good but your chances of survival are pretty much non-existent even if you are prepped on the operating table when it ruptures. Anyways he had a 15 year old with one and on the way to the hospital she looks at him and just says oh that feels so much better and died about 10 seconds later. RN here. I don't remember this guy's admitting diagnosis. He wasn't assigned to me, but my co-worker asked me to help start an IV on him. He needed a unit of blood and his peripheral access had gone bad. I placed a tourniquet and was ready to stick. Then he looked at me and said I'm dying. Immediately went unresponsive. I checked his pupils. I watched one dilate and the other constrict. We coded him. Never got him back. As a former EMT I can't count the number of people who said or screamed I am dying in the back of the ambulance. But, I always could tell by the look and the eyes of the ones who really knew it and were not just panicking. Don't let my mom come in, I don't want she to see me crying. She was 16, I wasn't prepared for that, got broke like glass. I'm not a medical worker but on the 28th of February of this year we had a bad ice storm in Oklahoma. I had no choice but to go into work and I worked 45 miles from home. The roads were awful and a solid sheet of ice. I witnessed a car accident. A double tractor trailer semi versus a Ford Focus. I had to stop because of it and I ran slid to her immediately. My dad is a retired firefighter EMT and my mom is a nurse so I wanted to try to help if I could. When I got to her she was hanging out of the driver's side window and the back of her head on one side was missing. When I went to feel for a pulse on her wrist, she grabbed me, even though she was unconscious. She was gurgling and wheezing. I stayed and held her as she died. I listened to the gurgling and begged her to open her eyes and she wasn't alone. That was the worst thing I heard. Her gurgling and death rattling. Sweet guy in his 20s with endocarditis. Heart valve infection. Caused by IV drug abuse. I was prepping him for his third open heart surgery when he sat up, looked me in the eye, and said, I'm going to die. Aren't I? He did not survive the surgery. Dang this one hit me hard. I had a guy who had a cardiac arrest in a swimming pool. He came to my IQ. The lifeguards has managed to get him back at the poolside so a short downtime which usually means a good thing. But turned out he had a dysahemia. 
funny heartbeat, which had resolved, so, we woke him up from his medically induced coma, and he was great, smiling, waving, talking, he remembered feeling unwell in the swimming pool etc. Fast forward 2 hours, and his nurse starts shouting for help. The guy is screaming and really agitated. He grabs me and looks me square in the eyes and shouts. Something really bad is about to happen. I have never seen fear or panic like it. He pulls out all his lines. He bites through his arterial lines so he's losing blood everywhere and he's standing on the bed screaming. We cannot calm him down or reassure him he is safe. He just screams and shouts and panics. And then he stops, collapses and goes into cardiac arrest and dies. In the medical profession, we talk about a sense of impending doom. I now work in palliative care so see lots of people who die. But this was so visceral. He was so scared. It was harrowing. I will never forget the look in his eyes. Occasionally my ADHD meds combine with a poor night's sleep or inadequate hydration and produce tachycardia. Sometimes, that comes with a very clear sensation, with a very vague meaning, that something is very wrong. I think I can imagine that, at a far greater intensity, with a far more serious heart problem, producing that kind of aura plus panic attack. Not a healthcare worker but my grandfather passed this week at 89 years old. He was a very sharp sane man, not senile or any dementia. The two days leading to his passing he began to see things. He told me, do you see Michelangelo painting? I said no. He said, he is painting invisible dust, everything he paints disappears, I hope the bathroom is still there. He also told us he could see little men jumping from the fan blades. It was really strange, it sounded like he was tripping acid but obviously he wasn't. He prayed over and over the night before he passed. We found him deceased in the morning. Not in the medical field, but when my grandmother was in the hospital with kidney failure and dementia. I went to visit about a week before she passed. After we heard the news and flew out, the nurse informed us of an exchange they had had the night off. How are you doing Mary Lee? Is there anything you want to do tomorrow? Oh, no. I believe I'm going to go see my mama tonight. She died a few hours later. EMT on a call where 16 year old girl and her mom were in a serious MVA. Mom was hanging on but daughter was in bad shape crushed chest, head cracked on dash. Pre-airbag days, first responders were trying to open wreckage to get access to patients. I was talking to the girl to try to keep her calm. She's moaning from pain. Can't see her mom due to blood caked over her eyes. She suddenly stopped moaning and said quite loud mom. It doesn't hurt anymore. Her mom lost consciousness at this point and didn't respond. Daughter turned her head slightly toward me and barely opened one eye just enough to make eye contact with me and whispered please tell my mom it doesn't hurt anymore. She was pronounced by an MD that showed up 3 minutes later. Obligatory not a medical worker boo at famous author Roald Dahl had planned his last words to be you know I'm not frightened. It's just that I will miss you all so much to his family. Instead. The nurse injected him with morphine to relieve his pain and his last words turned out to be OW, frick. Expectation versus reality. My buddy who went on to be a doctor had an elderly female patient, probably 9100 years old. Her daughter left the room to get coffee and my buddy had to check on her vitals. They were normal. Then she woke up, smiled and got teary eyed. She said I knew you'd come back for me. I am sorry I didn't marry you. My family won't let me, but I will now, I promise. My buddy just held her hand and smiled. She laid back and closed her eyes and her heart stopped. She had a DNR and was gone just like that. Her daughter had no clue what she meant. Her husband had been dead for 10 years and they were married since they were 20. My buddy doesn't know if it's relevant, but we are black and maybe she was in love with a black guy a long time ago. Because she was looking right at him when she spoke. IDK. Shoots weird. That's both sad and sweet. It probably brought her soul great comfort. When I was a senior resident a young man, late 20s, was admitted for pneumonia. He got worse quickly and I was called to his room to help while on call that night. He was having trouble breathing and needed intubated. I explained all this to him and that I would sedate him and then get him intubated so we could help him breathe. He agreed and we got everything ready. The last thing he said to me was doc. 
please don't let me die. I told him I would do my very best. I got him intubated and transferred to the IQ. A few weeks later I was on call covering the IQ and he was barely hanging on. I knew he would not make it through the night. He went into V-fib several times and I was able to bring him back, but only briefly. He was just too sick and he died shortly after that. It was horrible talking to his mother and girlfriend and comforting them knowing the last words he ever spoke were to me saying please don't let me die. As someone who has been there, but made it through, I can tell you what I meant when I said it. Save me, yes, but also fight for me and protect me. It's from a place of helplessness as I recall it. My body isn't doing what I tell it and I'm terrified. Sounds like you fought for him. I wouldn't be ashamed. Regret the battle you lost. Sure, but keep fighting the war, please. Work and M's. This doesn't happen very often. However I do distinctly recall an elderly gentleman who was determined to die in his home. Kept saying, I'm not going back to the hospital. I'm going to die here. Guy was having a pretty massive MI, was going to be dead in less than 12 hours. His wife and son pleaded for him to go to the hospital with us. Told him to think about his grandbabies. Told him point blank he was gonna die if he stayed. Reminded him about how alone and scared his wife would be. Tried so damned hard to figure out why he was afraid to go back. My unit and fire stayed on scene for over an hour trying to convince him to go. Even called a doctor to chat with him. He was old, but not old enough to go out just yet. Still mobile. Still fully present mentally. Sadly, we can't take people against their will. It's legally considered kidnapping. Eventually we had to leave this man. He was dead the next morning. The funny thing is, I respect the heck out of him. I think he knew something we couldn't accept, that he would pass even with intervention. I wouldn't want my body worked if I knew I was going to die anyways. Resuscitation is a violent, often fruitless endeavor. The most haunting thing for me isn't the death or gore itself though. It's hearing the family screaming when death is announced. Hearing people, especially children, scream for their mothers is the most painful for me. My goddamn tea is cold, tough 86 year old bird with orange hair white roots and tattoos. Last words spoken while having groin prepped with cold soap for cardiac catheterization. Old ladies who swear like sailors are among my favorite patients. My dad was his English and home was always England. Dad was in home hospice for 3 months, after 10 years with Parkinson's. He couldn't get out of bed anymore and one day he said to my mom, let's get out of here. My mom asked, where do you want to go home? I was taking a young patient of cervical injury into surgery. He looked at me and said, if I don't survive, please donate all my viable organs to people who need it. I looked at his chart. He was 24, the same age I was. I was an intern in the part of the world where organ transplant never takes place. He died during the surgery. Not his final words, but a couple years ago my grandfather choked during lunch. Paramedics revived him, but by the time he made it to the hospital there was no brain activity. I made my way from Houston to Tulsa to say my goodbyes and sat vigil with my grandmother. She still hadn't accepted that he was gone. No brain activity for 48 hours. As I sat with her at his bedside she was talking to him. It's time to wake up Johnny. She had been married to this man for 65 years and was basically begging for just a little more time. That had a profound effect on me as I had just gone through a pretty brutal divorce. I think we all did something right if we spent 65 years with someone and at the end they are asking for more time. Comma I think we all did something right if we spent 65 years with someone and at the end they are asking for more time. I want this less than 3. About 12 years ago we got some really bad news. My brother who had an undiagnosed autoimmune disorder took the news really bad. He got really sick and the next day he passed away. His last words were it's broken it's broken. My little brother was with him and he said it's okay I fixed it. Then he fell asleep and died. I think he was talking about his heart. I truly believe he died of a broken heart. It haunts me every day. I have heard of that happening, and witnessed the deterioration of a couple elderly people die after their spouse did. I don't know the biology behind it, but the will to go on without someone takes a toll on the body. Not a medical worker, but when I was 14 my friends and I were joking around before our 7th period theater class. My one friend, who was always a big goof, 
was playing along with a joke that he and another classmate were breaking up and said, this relationship is over then spun around around and fell to the floor for dramatic effect. Except it wasn't for dramatic effect, because he actually suffered heart failure and died instantly from an unknown condition. Acute myocarditis. None of us realized it and laughed along. I even picked up his glasses from the floor and put them on to tease him about how blind he was. When I tried to give him his glasses back I was struck by how discolored his face was, and then blood began to pour from his mouth. That's when the screaming started. Absolutely fricked me as a 14 year old to realize we could all just drop dead at any moment. My mate knows a guy who was out drinking with his mates. He stood up, downed his drink, said see you later, boys and fell backwards, dead before he hit the floor. When I was an intern on call in the IQ, we had an older lady who was completely stable and wasn't even on our radar of patients who might crash that night. But she did and did so very quickly to the point where we had to intubate while she was still fully lucid and conscious. Right before the intubation, she said I'm so scared and I'm going to die, aren't I? She coded twice before passing away. Even more sad was that she had no family other than a distant niece who referred to the patient as a bee and had no remorse for her passing whatsoever. My mom went an early morning to the hospital. She had double pneumonia. 76 years. Old. She went downhill fast. Called family in. About an hour or so before she passed she opened her eyes looked right at me and said I'm dying I'm dying. Watched her heart monitor go from 80 to 0. Saddest day of my life. Not from the patient but from a family member. After his elderly dad was pronounced, son was loudly yelling in his ear thanks for everything dad. I love you gets me emotional every time talking about it. My great aunt was dying from breast cancer and all of our family went to see her in the hospital one more time. When we arrived she was already in and out of consciousness. When I held her hand she knew it was me and woke up and was able to whisper the last thing she ever said. It was difficult for her but she was able to softly whisper tell everyone how much I will always love them and I'll never forget that special moment for the rest of my life. Love you great auntie. Miss you tonzo. My grandmother, long since dead, told the story of her grandfather's or great grandfather's deathbed scene. He had been in Sherman's march to the sea during the civil war years before. On his deathbed, he revisited the march and was ordering his men about, telling them to leave the woman and her kids a couple of chickens and to slaughter and burn everything else. No one in the room left unchanged when he died. I worked as a unit clerk in IQ some 20 years ago. There was an HIV positive man that came in, early 40s, and he'd signed a DNR DNI advanced directive. Do not resuscitate do not intubate. When he was first diagnosed, he knew death was inevitable and didn't want to drag it out. When he was admitted to the IQ with pneumonia, the doctors and nurses reconfirmed with him that he didn't want any heroic measures if he stopped breathing or if his heart stopped. He looked tired, and done with life, and said yes. Later that evening, his blood gases kept getting worse and his O2 sats kept dropping. He knew the end was coming for him, and all of a sudden, on a burst of energy, he's yelling for his nurse that he changed his mind and wanted to live. Those were his last words. I changed my mind. I want to live. Not a medical worker, but first responder qualified at the time. I found a guy lying on the street I sort of knew but didn't recognize then. Reeked of alcohol and smelled rotten. I grabbed his hand and tried to talk to him, and see what was going on, what happened, if he was in pain, etc. He looked at me and said, Diane, I didn't expect to see you here. He cried a bit, and stopped breathing soon after that. Diane was his late wife. He was dead before the ambulance got there, and my attempts at CPR didn't work. I feel bad for the EMTs because I might have blamed them for taking too long. I was with my father as he lay dying in the hospital. It was a long and emotionally exhausting process so we kids took turns sitting with him and holding his hand for when he would wake up. He was in and out of lucidity but just before he went he opened his eyes, gripped my hand hard, looked me in the eye and said, I don't like that guy in the black suit sitting over in the corner, my blood ran cold and I quickly looked over my shoe and there was an empty chair there. I don't know if he was remembering some incident from his past, hallucinating, or if he saw someone more sinister. I didn't mention it to my siblings for years and even since then they don't like to talk about it. Not a medic, but my grandfather is dying right now. 
92, kidney failure, on hospice. Went to see him yesterday and he was mostly out of it, but he asked about his dead relatives, and said he's hurt more than he's felt good. I told him that he has done a good job and that he's a good man. Not sure if he understood, but he replied I know. Multi gunshot wound in the trauma bay that had lost a lot of blood that we took back for an emergent slap. Girl was in her mid 20s and before we took her she just kept asking me over and over again for her mom. But she died early on the next morning. Not me and not related but I saw a cop on here who responded to a suicide a young kid about 20 and the cop talks with him for a while and the kid just interrupted him and said well you tried but it won't help and blew his head off. I read that one too. I can't imagine how scary that must have been. Less haunting and more just. Sad because of how young he was and how he was unaware of his final moments. Mommy, why are you crying? Those of you who work with pediatric terminal patients, all I can say is may God bless you all. How you have the courage to come into work each day amazes me. I know it doesn't mean much but truly thank you for standing in the gap for the rest of us. Elderly lady whose husband of 65 years died a few months before her. Where are we going? Me. Hospice volunteer. Well, you're going to see your husband. Her. Well, don't just stand there. Get my shoes on. I'm glad I kept scrolling and got to this one. I really love it and I love her. It made me smile. Not a medical worker, but I was giving lunch to my grandma and then she went to take a nap. She said see you later, little one. She did never woke. My grandfather died in the comfort of his own home, surrounded by family. As he was passing my mom, his daughter, recalls him calling out ever so softly mama, mama, great man, lived a long life of 84 years especially considering he smoked and drank beer his whole life. I'm not a medical worker but my mom told me about situation she had when my grandma was passing away in hospital. Mom and aunt were with her every day until she felt just very weak and they called a doctor and staff. They told them to leave the room. After 10 minutes of just sitting in the hallway mom and aunt could hear weird like little sigh or moan. Like I feel good type of moan. Which sounded like grandma's. They both looked at each other at this time and felt like it was next to them. They got chills and goosebumps. They couldn't hear anything from the room because they were too far away from it. Then the doctor came to tell them that she passed. They still don't know what was that but they like to think it was grandma's size which meant that she finally felt good and found peace after struggling so much with her illness. These weren't her last words but they definitely stuck with me. Lady lived in a facility. I knew I was going to die in here when they moved my furniture in. When admitting a new patient to the hospice home, she looked me dead in the face and said oh, I've been waiting for you. She died a few hours later. I expect odd things every shift in hospice, but some things just stick out. My wife is a nurse but this happened when I went to have lunch with her one day. I'm not even sure that it fits here, but it seems appropriate. She was helping an elderly woman back from the bathroom. Poor woman had no family there. When I walked in to let my wife know I was there, the woman brightened up and called me Arthur. He was her dead brother. Obviously she was deep into dementia. She asked me to tuck her into bed and hold her hand while she fell asleep. Of course there was no saying no. She drifted off to the eternal sleep a few minutes later, holding my hand, as I told her stories from my job, with the exception of raising my children. I'm not sure I'll ever do anything more important in my life. Not a medical worker but thought it's kinda relevant. My grandmother was relatively healthy until her mid 60s where she was suddenly paralyzed, pretty much, from the neck down and developed dementia, and she couldn't do anything for herself. As much as I wanted to be with her for every second of every day, it crushed me to see her in tears when she realized she forgot my name or when her pain was unbearable. My mum, her daughter, watched her die in her hospital bed. She wasn't in pain but she had no chance of fighting for her life. The last thing she said to my mum was number, please. Then she was gone. She went unconscious. I found out that she died not long after. I don't know what killed her or even caused her to be paralyzed. But to this day her last words, even though they weren't said to me, haunt me. 35 year old female, mother of two, one of them was a newborn, she had autoimmune hepatitis, minutes before her death, she told me, please, 
Say to my kids that I'll be waiting for them. That I am sleeping. My time is over. I must go to my lord's house. Thank you. I'll be taking care of you. God bless you. Minutes after, she had a cardiac arrest. Angelica, I miss you. You were my first death. Your kids are doing fine. And I know you are watching me. I'm doing my best as a doctor. My mom's last coherent words, about 48 hours prior, loss of morphine, etc., were to look me right in the eye and declare this sucks. IV drug user with multiple vegetations on three stroke four of his heart valves that were being thrown into his lungs and causing strokes, improving over several days with antibiotics and supportive treatment, strength returning, able to verbalize more, mentating better altogether. Told him he was getting better and that we're going in the right direction. Tells me I trust you 100%. Sudden hemorrhage in his brain hours later and pronounced brain dead. Obligatory not a medic. My wife's cousin was living in New Orleans. He and his wife were out at a bar one night. A mentally deranged person came up behind her and sliced her neck open. She looked up at her husband and said, why did he do that then she died. What's the last thing someone said to you before they died? My grandma told me she loved me and how I saved her life by buying her that cordless phone. 90s. Because she was just laying on the bathroom floor. But she carried it with her like I told her and was able to call for help. She had crocheted a bag for it. She was in the end stages of cancer and I was driving up 4 hours every weekend to stay with her. I'd bought the phone a few weekends before and told her to take it with her. She never had a cordless phone so it was a big deal for her. She religiously kept it charged and on her when she got up. She told me she'd see me that weekend. She died that night. But she died in a bed. With care around her. Not on the bathroom floor alone. My mother was at the end stage of leukemia. I called her to see how she was doing. She was pumped full of morphine and close to the end. She told me she loved me and we hung up the phone. My dad called not too long after and said she was near the end and I needed to get on a flight immediately. I caught the next flight out to see her before she passed away. My uncle picked me up from the airport and informed me she had died while I was on the plane. God, I cannot imagine how much that must have hurt. So sorry for your loss. You don't have to visit me every day. I'll leave hospital in two days anyway my father said. I replied I'd still visit next day as I love him. In the end we both were right. Sadly, he died 25 hours after that talk. So I visited his dead body next day. And he was transported out of hospital two days after we talked. I think this exchange will stick forever in my mind. I'm so sorry. My wife, not to me. But to our 14 year daughter just as they and my 7 year son entered a store. Oh, daughter name. I'm fainting her heart just stopped. Dang I'm sorry you guys had to go through that. See you tomorrow. My father on the phone. I found him dead in his house the next day. Fell. Cracked his head open. Oh that's awful I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Be a good chapter my grandfather. I do try to be good. To be kind and respectful to others. To give what I can when I can. To stop and help when it's needed. I'm by no means perfect. No one is. But striving to be better for others is the best any of us can do. And what he was like right up till the end. He was so loved by the community the church at his funeral had people standing in the wings. And it had a capacity of 1000. He actually was forced to retire as a GP by grandma at like 75. But still snuck out to see patients. He had a practice behind the house with a few doctors. Yay my grandma told me to be a good boy look after your brothers and your parents I love you she held out to talk to me I flew home and talked to her for 2 minutes then she started to die. I was the last person she talked to. She have had a lot of death in my life mostly all more tragic than my 93 year old chain smoking grandma but I miss her the most. Oh it's fine. Just a bump to the head. I'll take a painkiller and have a nap. Love you. My mom died of a brain hemorrhage 5 hours later. This hits close to home. I was home with my mom and little brother when she started feeling unwell. We fought about her going inside to rest. Long story short, we got her to a hospital in time that she eventually recovered from her hemorrhage. That month while she was in the coma I often wondered if our last interaction would be a fight. I'm so sorry your mom didn't survive hers. 
by, my name. It was my big brother, he was in late stage terminal cancer. He passed at home the following night morning. My dad said I'm gonna pass out, I'm passing out then died in my arms. OMG that's tough. Hugs my friend. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. My grandfather had been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer and refused all treatment. In his words, I'm 86 years old. What the heck is the point the last time I saw him he looked bad and was clearly in a lot of pain. But he kept insisting that he didn't want anyone making a big fuss over him. He died 3 days later. The feel of accepting death wakes a huge dreadful feeling in me. Sorry for your loss. A man who helped raise me died about 2 days after I saw him last. Our final interaction was him telling the most embarrassing story about me to my new girlfriend. Thanks Steve. It's what he would have wanted to end on. The last conversation I remember having with my grandpa before he died he asked me if I was still playing guitar, and I said I was. My grandpa tells me every time I see him how much it makes him happy that I play. My grandpa, on the phone. I wish we could have met. He lived in New Zealand. I live in Australia. I had met him, many times. Tore me up inside that it had been so long since I'd visited him that he'd forgotten me. It's not you, I promise. When my grandpa was gradually getting worse dementia, my dad visited him 3-5x a week and talked to him on the phone multiple times a day, usually the same conversation, because grandpa forgot. Even with that, every time dad saw him grandpa would, sometimes gently, sometimes not, chide him for never coming to see me. I don't remember specifically but I was telling my mom about how I was excited to finally move out and buy on my own. Well my own with roommates. And she gave some sort of no word verbal acknowledgement. She had a stroke in her sleep later that day. Tucked in my gf. Kissed her goodnight. Told her I loved her amd would see her in the morning. She kissed me back said love you babe and she passed that night. I found her in the am. When I went to kiss her goodbye before I left for work. ETA, I am totally flawed by the traction this seems to have gotten. First thank you so much for the love, condolences, and stories that you all have shared with me. I am both in awe and honored. Second, I am getting through, one foot in front of the other. Some days are better than others. Thirdly she died from complications from a number of things she had going on. Type 1 diabetes, arthritis, fibra, congestive heart failure and reduced kidney function and it didn't help she spent half of deck pretty much all of jan and nearly half of february in the hospital from complications stemming from breaking her ankle pneumonia and an infection in her hardware for the broken ankle so this wasn't totally out of the blue but it still sucks i've learned it never gets better you just get used to the idea that they're gone to some of the younger redditors don't be afraid to love deeply honestly openly it's worth the pain that sometimes comes when we go the only things we leave behind are the stories people tell and the memories we've made so enough of me being maudlin i'm gonna have another beer or two and go to bed happened to me and my boyfriend he kissed me on the forehead told me he loved me he went to take a nap but i couldn't wake him up it was the day after the best valentine's day my grandpa told me I was his favorite grandchild before passing. That caused quite a stir of jealousy afterwards amongst his children and grandchildren. Pretty much ruined the memory. Fortunately, not the feeling though. My friend's grandfather died a few years back. He had six grandkids and asked to see them all alone and individually told them that they were his favorite and to not tell anyone. He died a couple days later. I thought that it was funny and sweet. Alright clone. Talk to you later buddy. Guy I played Codger with for a while. Went by the name of Pepper. Really good dude. I can't remember when. But it wasn't long after that I got a message from one of the other regulars on that server that Pepper had died. Sent me a link to a news article. Apparently he had confronted some guy early in the morning for riding his dirt bike up and down the street making a lot of noise. The guy and someone else came back later to confront him. They ended up running him over twice. Killing him. His nephew came out, just in time to watch the tires go over his head. He was such a cool guy. I always enjoyed playing and talking with him. R.I.P. Pepper, miss your man. It's weird how those gaming friendships can run deep over time. 
I want to live. I don't want to be fed and watered and turned to the sun like some kind of plant. Since this blew up, he did die. He was going in for brain surgery and the outcome was questionable. Him saying that made it a lot more possible for me to consent to withdrawing life support when it became necessary. Oh this is so sad but also sounds like whoever said this was a strong person. I hope they found peace x. My husband, trying to get out of the hospice bed, again, when he didn't have the strength to stand. In exhausted frustration I snapped at him, and he laid back down, saying I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The last words he ever said to me, he died a few hours later. It haunts me still. My grandma was in hospice. She just looked up at me and whispered in the smallest, most childlike voice, I wanna go home. I still hear that to this day. 99 year old grandfather after recurring many heart attacks over a couple of weeks, tell, wife, I said hello, I will see you later with his slight grin and a wink, he knew, I knew, we all knew, great guy, and always had a great attitude under any circumstance he faced, that felt kind of heavy, but also kind of nice, you all knew, he went out with a grin, and with you by his side, what a badass. The one that always will stick with me was when I was working on the ambulance. Got called to home during a blizzard for a 35 year old male seizing and foaming at the mouth. Me and my partner and a trainee I had with me go and respond. And while en route get an update that patient was now conscious and admitted to ingesting poison intentionally. Poison control and medical control call us to advise he admitted to using strychnine. A potent nerve toxin used in the old days for rodent control on farms or industrial sites primarily. We get up to the house and I start talking to him. Get an IV established. Give him activated charcoal per med control. And he is completely honest with me. He tells me he took it cause he had been fighting depression and anxiety for years and work finally put him over the edge. While his girlfriend was in the shower he mixed it into his drink and chugged it and took some sleeping aids hoping he would pass in his sleep and be less traumatic for his girlfriend. He went to bed like nothing was wrong and his girlfriend came out to find him seizing on the bedroom floor. He grabbed me by the shirt and he said I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I did this to you. He seized again while holding my shirt and began to vomit and aspirate. He went pulseless shortly after and me and the trainee did CPR for 16 minutes, unable to travel in the storm. That is one of many calls that will stay with me forever. On a coaching course for a week. How are you guys? Last WhatsApp message from my brother. I never responded because I was too busy. This one kind of hits me harder than most of them here. Sometimes we just keep living. Sometimes we go on weeks or months without catching up and in that time something can happen. The worst is how sudden it is. No crescendos or legendary send offs with well their words. You just find out. Thank you. As usual. It's really about time I returned the favor. My older brother had told me this countless times before. He almost always said it when he left. I responded with the usual. He was strange in the prior conversation. But because he seemed in a better mood than normal. That last goodbye. The same as always promise that had just become a formality. Just felt so normal. I had no idea he'd already resolved to take his own life. He was saying goodbye for good. And I didn't even notice. My uncle was hit in the head with brass knuckles and his last words to me were I wasn't hit. It was just a door 12 year old me said that wasn't a door. You were hit and he said then why'd you ask? We were both laughing about it and he said he was okay. He wasn't. That and my aunt I was making something for when I was 11. I kept telling her to stay for 5 more minutes while I finished. She said I'll be back early tomorrow. She passed away that night. My best friend. It was great to see you. Can't wait to hang out with you again soon. He died a few weeks later in a snowmobile accident before we could make time to get together. After he passed, I decided that if I ever had a son I would give him my friend's middle name, Aaron. Fast forward 10 years and my wife was pregnant with our first son. When she was having trouble detecting his movement we went to the hospital and she was given an emergency c-section. We didn't realize it until later but Aaron was born 10 years to the day that my friend passed away. Aaron was released from the NICU 8 days later, on what would have been my friend's birthday. Wow that is a wild timeline. My mom fell into a coma about a week before she died from lung cancer. Don't smoke, but the last time I saw her conscious, 
She called me by my childhood nickname and said she loved me and was proud of me. In terms of a parent's last words, it was the best thing she could have said. I still tear up when I think of it, 10 years later. The last thing my dad said to me was, My sister, is taking me to the hospital. I'm not feeling well. Tell, your daughter. I said I love her too and I will see you guys soon. He went into surgery and never woke up. Died 4 days later. Sorry for your losses. But I think that when your mum called you by your childhood name that just symbolizes that no matter what, you're always gonna be their kid. That's beautiful that they still have that in their forefront of their mind. To be somewhat childish. Near the end. My father calling me and wishing me a happy birthday two weeks before he passed away. Two days before I flew home. Two months ago. The day before my grandfather slipped into his last sleep my car broke down. He heard about it and gave me a lot of money when I visited him. The last thing he said to me, I wanted to see you smile for one last time. For me, my grandfather was lending me his truck so I could take my stuff for my second year of university. Last thing I heard him say was don't forget to check the oil. Died about two weeks later suddenly. My dad and I took that truck to the funeral, and on the way there the oil light came on. About 6 months ago I was with my mum on the phone to my grandma who was dying from covid pneumonia. Mum said to her I love you. She replied I love you too. Her words were barely audible over the phone with her breath so laboured. Grandma, who I was very close to, didn't know I was also on that call to her. I couldn't bring myself to tell her I also loved her because I knew I would have broken down and burst into tears as soon as I opened my mouth to speak. I wanted to tell her so much. I was desperate to, but just couldn't. She died an hour or so later. I love you too were the last words I heard her say, but I still feel horrible sadness and regret that I didn't tell her I loved her while I had an opportunity in her final moments. She was such a lovely part of my life and I'll never stop missing her. She knew, and she knows. Put the regrets behind you. She knows. Love never ends. My father was mostly non-verbal and not lucid while declining from cancer. I was sitting bedside when he suddenly woke up and started getting out of bed. Where are you going? Dad I asked. He looked at me, his eyes twinkling above a huge smile, and said, I'm going to get some ice cream, boy. Come here my granddad wanting to tell me something before I went to work I said I'll see you when I finish the. He died while I was at work. Kills me inside knowing he wanted to tell me something before he died. Maybe he wanted to tell you that he loves you because he knew he was about to pass away. Saw my childhood best friend after a few months. We were both busy and walking opposite directions and I told him I'd come over tomorrow to catch up and play some Xbox. Died in a car crash that night. He was 14. Would be turning 20 this year if he made it. Ah that hurts to read. I also lost a friend at 14. Two years back. Hope you're doing well. Don't stop riding. My dad, brother and I were heavily into mountain biking. My dad found a group through his work that rode their bicycles in a group on the weekend. I was a teenager at the time but I became friends with an older lady named Joyce. On a road ride one morning, all the slower people, me, my dad, Joyce and a few others, were drafting off each other. When it was my turn, I accidentally clipped Joyce's handlebar and she went down hard. Now it was a nasty fall, but it wasn't bad enough to cause anything serious. Her protective gear should have saved her, but she was down. She was in a lot of pain and couldn't move without crying. We ended up having to call an ambulance. 14 year old me was distraught that I hurt her so bad. A week or two later we get a call. Joyce had advanced stage cancer and the unexplained extreme pain from the fall was related to it, and that was how the doctors discovered it. I'll cut this short, the meds didn't work, and she was told she had less than 6 months. When it was our turn to visit her, she let me know that she doesn't blame me for what happened, and that I shouldn't let this stop me from riding. Don't stop riding. Your accident may have been a blessing. Not everyone has a chance to say goodbye, she did. My aunt's last words that I heard from her were you've grown so much as I was a little kid, about 5, and she hadn't seen me for a while. The sheer innocence and love in that phrase is what I associate with my aunt now, and she was amazing. 
My maternal grandma said something similar to me. I immigrated to the USA with my parents when I was 4-5 and didn't visit it again until I was like 15. At that time my grandma was bedridden and I was told she had lost her memory. But when I met her she was lucid enough to know who I was and asked me how my mother was doing. Thank you for taking such good care of me. You did a wonderful job. My mother after a stupid accident caused her to die a little prematurely while she was terminally ill with pancreatic cancer. I was her primary caregiver for the last 7 months of her life. We knew she wouldn't wake up in the morning. It'll be 5 years on the 3rd of June. Still hard to think about. I lost my grandma exactly 6 years ago. I know it's hard. But I also know that they would have loved to see us living at the best we could. Sending a lot of hugs. Before my husband completed suicide, he jumped up out of bed and said I'm just so rattled. I'm going to go call. My friend. Found him passed about 2.5 hours later. I talked to his friend and found out he didn't actually call him that night so I think he just said that to keep me from following him. It was late and we both had to work in the morning, but this particular friend was someone he talked to when he was having problems with his PTSD. My friend in college died by suicide. He sent me a message on FB messenger saying I need a hug, but FB messenger glitched, didn't send me the notification, and I didn't see the message until after it happened. Painful to remember. When I woke her up she said why did you wake me up? After I kissed her goodbye she said you can't wake me up anytime. That sounds like real love. I am so sorry she's gone. Not sure if this counts, but a friend from university who was in Denmark, I'm in the UK sent me one of those multimedia messages. I assume it was because it was a really long message, but I messaged him back, thinking maybe it was just a picture at the time, and said you should get what's up my guy. I can't see what you've sent me, I didn't get a response, and found out a week later that he had killed himself. I was never able to convert the message after and I have no idea what he wanted to say. I still think about it from time to time, but I try not to linger on the memory now. It feels too heavy. My ex used to give a work colleague a lift to and from work. We were about to have time off for a holiday. On the last day before we left, the work colleague said goodbye and thank you. After our holiday, we called in to see him to check for future travel arrangements to find out that he had died while we were away. Didn't say anything but I got a thumbs up. A friend of mine's brain cancer came back. He didn't want people seeing him too much because of what the chemo was doing to him. After he was hospitalized I arranged to go visit him. He was completely out of it when I got there but I had a nice conversation with his wife about all the arrangements they were making so they could bring him home the next week. I was going to leave but his wife woke him up so he knew I was there. He was too out of it to talk but I got a thumbs up. I went home and started talking to my friends about putting together some kind of welcome home care package. I got a call the next weekend to say he had passed. That was about 5 years ago. I still have the care package. I don't know what to do with it. Give it to his wife. I think she would like to see how much all of his friends cared for him. And how much you loved him to do that for him. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. for now.